Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Going to be having a little bit of fun with Microsoft Word 2016. It is, of course, the latest and greatest offering from the Microsoft Office suite. Uh, going to go through and cover some things that might look a little basic, but we'll go in depth on them, and then cover some tips and tricks that you might not otherwise know about. Uh, we'll do a quick history on uh, the product itself, and then we're going to go into these topics that you can see. So we're going to cover the ribbon and how to customize it. We're going to talk about researcher and insights. Uh, we're going to go into how to set and use quick parts. We're going to take a look at the themes and styles, uh, show how to create a table of contents automatically. We're going to explore Format Painter, uh, show how to use the updated version of Find and Replace. We'll show you how to customize AutoCorrect, get into a little bit of sharing and collaboration, and then I've got a few bonus tips for you as well. Those of you who have sent in questions beforehand, I have compiled the ones that uh, I can answer most easily in this particular format. If afterwards you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us uh, again. Anything that has not already been answered, we will do our best to contact you. But if you don't hear from us, please feel free to make that outreach. We do want to make sure that all of your questions do get answered one way or the other. So. I'm going to take a look at Microsoft Word itself. It started way back in 1983. It's when it was first officially introduced as Microsoft Word. It was based off of a previous product. Microsoft wooed a couple of programmers from a previous company who took the product that they had made there, turned it into the fantastic Word editor that we know and love today. It's kind of cool that the first free demo copies were given away via floppy disk, the big, square, thin floppies, not the small, firm ones, but the old five-inch floppies. They gave them away at the November 1983 edition of PC World magazine, and that was one of the first times that free software was ever given away that way. Uh, anybody who had magazine subscriptions, even into the mid-2000s, probably remembers that those software giveaways uh, were things that continued to happen for quite some time. I remember even relatively recently still getting uh, Xbox demo games with Xbox Magazine, things like that. So it started way back in 1983 with Microsoft Word. It's kind of fun to know. It actually didn't really achieve commercial success until Windows 3.0 was released in 1990. But once that was out there, Microsoft Word took off and it has dominated the market ever since. The autocorrect feature that we live and die by today was actually first introduced in version 6.0 in 1993. That fact actually surprised me because I would have thought that autocorrect seems like a much more modern concept, especially with the smartphones that we use today. It turns out that it started way back in 93. So autocorrect has been around actually before the spell check suggestions were. That came much later. The red squiggly line underneath the misspelled words actually came after autocorrect. So that was fun to know. And then the ribbon that was sort of a stylistic revolution for Microsoft Word first made its appearance in 2007. So we're going to go ahead and start the presentation there with the ribbon. Now, when it was first announced, the ribbon was not super popular. People didn't like the change. They weren't used to the way that uh, the way that it's presented, everyone's used to the standard menu options that we have along the top here, but this ribbon with all of these icons and options here, people were afraid that it was too cluttered or too messy or it was overwhelming. But as the product got more feedback and as we've used it throughout time, it has gotten a lot more refined and it is a lot more customizable. So some of the cool things about this is that anything that you want to have in your ribbon, you can set to have in your ribbon. Features that you use frequently, if you right click on them, you can add them to a custom quick access toolbar that would be shown below the ribbon. So you can have any of your favorite features saved up here as well. So if there turns out to be something that you just use all the time, you can set it so that all of your favorite features are in this quick access toolbar. Uh, within the ribbon itself, a lot of the features that are available are, are customizable as well. So when you get into things like styles, you can modify the styles that are there by right-clicking on it. 
A lot of options have other options, other sub options beneath them if you right click on them as well. Otherwise you can just add it to the ribbon, customize the ribbon, collapse the ribbon if you just don't want to look at it anymore, or if you need a bigger screen to see, you can open and close it with the either the view tab or the view menu, or you can use the, the buttons that pop up as well. Going back over here to the home tab. You can see that a lot of the overview in the ribbon is very well organized. If you think about it in the way of, you know, what do, what am I looking for? I want to add a shape. I want to add an element. Most of those items are going to be in insert along with formatting options under draw. If you're doing individual shapes that you're going to freehand. Design is where you're going to find your themes and how to edit those. So this is all very well organized and you can tell that they've taken a lot of input from the actual users as to how to structure this so that it is very, very intuitive. You shouldn't have to hunt too hard anymore in the ribbon to find the item that you are looking for. Even using it very often, every once in a while I'll think of something that, oh, you know, I'd like to add this element, wonder where to find it. I take a guess and it's usually right in front of my face. So it's very, very well designed. And with every edition that Microsoft does release, it is a little bit more polished. The nice thing about it though is if you have upgraded to the 2016 version and maybe you really like the way that something was set up in the 2010 version, you can go through and you can customize the quick, uh, the customize the ribbon and set anything that you want. So if there's an item that's missing, feel free to go through this list and add it. Uh, it populates the most popular commands to start. You can also look at all commands that are not in the ribbon. This is my favorite way to find something. If I'm looking and I don't see it, I'll choose the option for commands not in the ribbon and it is all alphabetical. So it's very, very easy to navigate. Just take you know, your best guess for what to, you know, how to phrase what you're looking for. Since I'm talking about uh, how to phrase things, I do want to touch on one of the biggest changes for uh, the more recent version of Microsoft Word. And this is something that is an element that is available across all of the uh, Microsoft Office suite, is instead of search, there's the tell me what you want to do feature. So instead of searching for a phrase, uh, let's say if you want to know how to add a hyperlink. Instead of saying, how do I add a hyperlink, you would just tell it what you want to do. So just add link, add a hyperlink. And it tells you exactly how to do it right there. And it'll actually bring up the window that you need to add whatever it is that you're trying to add or to do whatever it is that you're trying to do. So not only will it show you how to do it, it just gives you the feature that you wanted in the first place. So if you're missing something, you can't find it, tell Word what you want it to do and it will just give it to you. It's super intuitive and it's actually a really exciting feature, I think, uh, just because it saves so much time in that it just gives you the dialog box that you are looking for. It doesn't make you go hunt for it, it doesn't make you, you know, read through a bunch of paragraphs to figure out, okay, you know, how do I do this step by step? It just hands it to you. So, very good feature that is something, like I said, that is available in all of the Microsoft Office suite. So, it's one of my favorite new features. Next thing we're going to look at uh, is going to be Researcher and Insights. I've got my little custom template here. This is, or my uh, example template. I just made up a little company newsletter for a company that doesn't really exist, but put in some elements that we might want to use uh, during any sort of company newsletter that you might want to put out. So we've got some elements here, but I want to talk about researcher first, just because it is one of the more quietly kept secrets of the most recent version of Microsoft Word. I actually saw on Facebook a couple days ago uh, that there were a lot of college students who were just finding out about this feature and were lamenting the fact that they didn't know it existed earlier because it is so robust for students. It's a fantastic feature that was really kind of developed for students in the first place, but there are a lot of business applications as well. So for instance, in this mock newsletter that I have. 
I've decided that you know maybe something that we might want to put in a newsletter, something that might, if you are uh, an IT company or some sort of you know information sciences uh, company, that maybe a history lesson on some element of technology would be something that you would want to share in a friendly newsletter. That seems like the kind of content that maybe readers would be interested in. So in this hypothetical company, they're going to want to do a little history lesson about Windows 3.0. So a couple of options that we have here. If I highlight this and right click, uh, option here in the drop down menu for smart lookup. So if I search this for smart lookup, it is a feature that you do have to enable. The first time that you try and use this feature, it's going to ask uh, for some settings. It's going to ask for you to enable the information. And once you do it, it does load pretty quickly and is a nice robust feature. So what it's done is in this sidebar, it's done a search. Of course, it is a Microsoft product, so it does use Bing. If you're not a fan of the Bing search engine, you know, maybe this will give you a reason to like it a little bit more. It does pull up very, very clean results within the, uh, within the Word software itself. So these results are very easily digestible. I haven't seen it pull anything that is inappropriate, so it seems like a fairly safe feature to use as well. They've coded it quite nicely so that it is uh, easy to use for multiple applications, including for students. So this has given me a couple of uh, Wikipedia results. It's also given me some image results and then some general web results. So if I click on one of these, I can see it's opening in uh, Microsoft Edge browser by default. That's just the default browser that I have set with my computer. Uh, of course, it is running Windows 10, so I just kind of left it uh, to do its own thing because it is very clean and very uh, user-friendly. If you like a different browser, feel free to use it, um, but you may not get the same exact results as you would if you left everything native to the Microsoft product. So this just goes ahead and brings up the uh, Wikipedia page on what we're looking at. This is good for, say, you're uh, making reference to something and you just can't quite remember the details. Maybe you can't remember exactly what something was called. You can use that smart lookup feature to do a quick web search right within Word itself. It'll launch that external window, but all of that info is there for you. So that's if you just need to take a quick peek at something. Now I'm going to come up here, though, to the References tab, and I'm going to look at this feature here called Researcher. As the uh, menu, the uh, additional information populates, you can see it describes the feature as, let us help you find quotes, citable sources, and images. Right next to it, you can see uh, this info here about citations, managed sources, the style, uh, the bibliography. So if you are someone who has spent any time in academia whatsoever, I'm sure you have had to cite your sources on a paper, a research paper, at some point. So this automatically comes with all of the most popular citation styles, and it formats it automatically for you, and then gives you the ability to go and edit things afterwards. Not only do you have the ability to edit it, it stays as a live feature within Word unless you specify otherwise. So if you are digitally submitting papers as a student, uh, you have the option to keep that information in there. The professor or whoever is taking a look at the paper or a teammate or what have you has the option to view the citation within Word itself as opposed to having to include a bunch of extraneous text as well. So this could also be useful for business if you have people doing research within the company as well, whether that is market research or studying some other aspect of a product or the business itself. So this isn't just for students, this is something that you can use you know, well beyond school days. We'll go back over to Researcher itself, and if you click on it, it gives you this search bar. So the history lesson that we want to give is on Windows 3.0. And it works just like a normal search engine. Gives you these results here. Gives you a couple different options here where you can search for everything. You can search for books. So if you specifically need references that are not websites, something that is more geared towards students but does have business applications as well, if you've got an assignment where they have said, you know, you can't use a website, you have to use hard copy sources, 
this will give you information on those hard copy sources. Otherwise, for the most part, uh, for this application, for business application, the website search is going to be what um, you're really going to be looking for. So you can scroll on through here and see all of this information on Windows 3.0. So you can go ahead and click on one and see what information is in that uh, particular option. If you don't like that one, you can go back, take a look at some of the others. Maybe you want to refine it a little bit more. Let's call it history, Windows 3.0 history. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's go with this article here. Where Microsoft 3.0 it was 20 years old today. No, I just don't like that one either. I actually had when I was demoing this earlier, I had found a result that I thought was perfect for this. And now I wish that I had kept tabs on it. Let's see. Okay, so this will do. We'll start here. So let's say that we're uh, wanting to share a little bit of information about Windows 3.0, and I like this first paragraph here. So I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this, and let's see. You can drag and drop directly from this window here, or you can open it up in Reading View and see all of the information that's actually on the web page. And you can do the same thing here with selecting it. That's the same paragraph. Let's come down and find some new information. So if you highlight this, once you're in reading view, a pop-up comes up right away. This is Add and Cite. So you click on Add and Cite. It's going to add the content into your documents. And if you come up to your citations, you can change which citation is in here. Now this is giving the citation in line in the paragraph. So it's right here. And this is the feature that I was mentioning. It gives you this drop down where you can edit the citation, you can edit the source. If you click edit source, uh, it'll give you these customization options as well it shows you the URL where it came from, the name of the website, the name of the web page, and the author. So you're going to see this is a really, really robust uh, way to include information from external sources that you are citing, so you're giving credit to the original source, and uh, having that information directly in your uh, your paper or your newsletter or whatever document it is that you are working on. Uh, so let's say then that once I've got this, I'm going to click at the end of this paragraph, and I want to add my references in line. So you could actually see the full text of the references as opposed to just what is in uh, the paragraph itself. And this is something that, especially if you're doing you know research of any kind, you are going to want references, a list of references in there so that people know that it's not research that you did yourself, it's you know information that you have sourced elsewhere. These um, this now shows you the two websites that I have that I've looked at, the two sources for um, the information. So once you're done with that, you can go ahead and close that pane if you need to go back into it. Go back to researcher and you can even see my research. You do have to log in um, to your either your Outlook account or your Microsoft account to be able to view saved research, but you, once you do log in, you do have the option to bookmark research that you have used before. So that is extra handy, especially if you have sources that you really love, uh, that you want to use often. And again, from a business standpoint, you may not need to necessarily do a whole bibliography or references, but say there's a source for jokes, or there's a source for uh, tech tips that you really like, or there's a source for recipes that you like to share. Keeping those things bookmarked as well makes it very, very easy to add content directly to your newsletter. And of course, you can also add content from your own website. So that information uh, can be stored there within Word itself. Right, so that is Researcher.
Next up, I'm going to take a little stroll into Quick Parts. Quick Parts is sort of like uh, mini macros. It gives you options to back over to my ribbon here. It gives you the options to not have to type things over and over again that you use frequently. So something that in a business newsletter or a flyer or anything that you are publishing through Word, you're probably going to want to have your company information uh, somewhere that is easily accessible. You can put it in the header or the footer. It might get a little cluttered. Maybe you want to make it really stand out. This is a great way to do it, but of course you're not going to want to type it out every single time, especially if you start adding phone numbers and fax numbers and email addresses, you know, maybe even like a company byline, something like that. It'd be nice to just be able to have that available to you without having to remember exactly the format, maybe especially if you've got multiple phone numbers. Uh, it is a lot of information that could potentially get lost. So under the Insert tab, there is the option over here. Now, mind you, if you don't see something exactly where I see it, I have done my best to leave my edition of Word as close to out of the box as possible. That said, I can't rule out that I may have dragged and dropped something somewhere at some point without recalling that I did that. I do try to leave it alone, especially for doing these demos, so that you can see exactly where to find the option. But if you don't see it, of course, you can always use the tell me what you want to do. Just type in, you know, quick parts if you don't find quick parts. Okay, so you're going to want to highlight the information, go into insert, and then quick parts. This option here, right at the top where it says auto text, you have the option to save selection to auto text gallery. If you click on that, not left click or not right click, that you can add this is going to say create new building block. So building blocks are what they are calling these individual elements that you can add one at a time or in batches at any point. So this one we're going to name it, um, it's going to automatically populate the first line of text. Let's say I want to call this uh, company address. You can leave it in the, uh, the gal gallery and category that it sets as default, or if you have a lot of these that you end up building, feel free to you know, create individual galleries and categories for these things uh, so that you can search them even more quickly. I'll show you in a second what it looks like to start navigating these building blocks. So I'm just going to click OK, and it is going to have this set. And it is going to remember the formatting exactly as is. You can always overwrite it later. Then let's say that I'm working on a new newsletter and I want to add that. I can now click on the arrow for quick parts, go over to auto text. It is showing me the company address. This is the item that I have just entered and I can drop it right in there. And it gives me exactly what I entered before. Now I did mention the building block. So that individual element is called a building block. That's what it's referred to. It's what Word has named it. So let's say that the company moves and uh, you go to a new office, you open a new office, maybe you want to edit that. It is very nice that it uh, considers, it sorts these automatically by the gallery, so it is alphabetical, or alphabetically auto text comes up first. You can of course always sort it um, any other way that you like, but leaving it as sorted alphabetically by gallery gives you all of the auto text options that you have entered up at the top. So once you get here, you can edit the properties of it, which is that same context uh, that was there before. If you don't want it anymore, you can delete it. So let's say that uh, we just, we never want to see that again. Go ahead and make it go away. I can delete that building block. So you can go through and customize these other ones that are in here as well. This is, for the most part, um, things that are more easily accessed elsewhere. That said, if you do ever want to change any of the elements in here, or if there are just some that you absolutely hate, you can make them go away. You don't have to deal with features that you don't want. I love that Word gives you the option to not just customize what you see, but customize what you don't see. So I do appreciate that kind of flexibility and the ability to uh, really take control over the software that you are using. All right, next up we're going to get into the real fun, 
we are going to start talking about themes and styles. Of course, every company knows that branding is a huge part of who you are as a company, how you are forward-facing to your clients and the public in general. It sets the tone for pretty much everything that you do. So, of course, you're going to want your newsletters or your documents or whatever it is that you are creating in Word to reflect your company branding. Now, I didn't take the time to go through and create a fake logo for my ABC company, but uh, you can add logos in just about anywhere that you want. You can add them in your footer, or I'm sorry, you can add them in your header if you prefer it that way, or you can just insert it as a graphic here. But when we go to design, the design tab is going to let you pick an overall theme that sets the tone for your document. So if you want something that is a little bit more contemporary, you can choose one of these styles that has a more casual contemporary font. And this sets all of the elements for the entire document. This is going to set your, your font, the font colors, uh, the font sizes, the different heading options. So this is one big package of all of the features. Once you find one that you like, then you can go through and change the color scheme here for, again, the entire document. Uh, you can pick one of the ones that comes already pre-populated by Microsoft, or if you don't see one that you like, you can customize the colors yourself. So in this customization option, it even gives you a nice little preview of what your page is going to look like. Uh, it gives you options for a dark theme, options for a light theme, so you can see how it might look, especially if you are doing a larger, more comprehensive document, especially if you're working on something that is going to be going to print and uh, you want it to be a full color print as opposed to just a casual newsletter. You have the option to see how all of those elements are going to look and uh, customize them so that you have all of the options in a complete and robust theme as opposed to editing them piecemeal, you know, starting from a blank document like I have here. So this is a great way to get started with the overall look and feel of your website. And if you use this, uh, the expander there, you can also see uh, more of the options and it does give you a real-time preview as well. So let's go ahead and pick one that looks a little more like a newsletter. I don't even know that I'm finding one that I love. So I guess we're just going to use one. We're going to pick this. All right, so these are themes, and again, you can edit them to your heart's content. You can change the paragraph spacing, you can add watermark, you can add page borders, all here, and anything that you edit in themes will affect the entire document. Now, if you want to make smaller changes, changes to individual blocks, or if you uh, just want to make a little bit more tweaking and customization, can come into styles. So now that I've got this overall newsletter and I've got my theme set up, I can start applying the elements of the theme via styles. So this here, this line here, if I triple click, of course it gives me, it highlights the entire item there, I can choose that I want this to be my title. Now, even though I don't necessarily love the fact that the font is as big as it is, setting the style element makes it referential to other elements within Word itself. Namely, the next thing that we're going to go over is going to be the table of contents. So it's important that if you want to automatically take advantage of some of the features that Word offers you as far as how the different pieces of this document will play together with other pieces, it's important to go ahead and use the styles and assign them correctly. So I am going to let it do that. So this is going to be my title. But I can right click on it and modify. All right, so this font I like. Uh, the color black is good, but I don't need that font to be quite so big. So I'm gonna bring this down to, let's see. Let's make it, let's just make it a little bit, right about there I think is good. And click OK. 
I'm going to make the executive decision that I want that on a second line. Okay, so now that kind of stands out as the title. Next thing, now that I've got these, uh, the overall title set, I'm going to want to start defining the different sections. So this introduction I'm going to set as heading 1, and then within the introduction I'm going to also include what's new as a subheading. So you can see that the heading 1 in this particular theme sets all caps and this uh, visual indicator over here, this little green bar, that is a style element that is within the theme that I'm currently using. If you don't like that particular element there, of course, that would be something that you'd want to go back into the theme, maybe select something different, or edit the theme so that that graphic element is not added automatically. And then the subheadings are the heading uh, level 2. Increases the size of the font, changes the font face, and uh, but it's not all caps. So you can see there's a little bit of visual differentiation there. And then employee spotlights, I am going to make its, uh, let's make that its own section, and then our history lesson can also be uh, its own area. And you can also see that this references section here that came up uh, is yeah, the level one heading in and of itself. For now, just for the purposes of the uh, demonstration I'm doing, I'm actually going to remove this entire element just because sometimes the elements like to hang out. Okay, that's better. <laughs> it's still showing that it's there. All right, but it's visually not there. This is fine. Good enough for now. All right, and then how are we doing at the end? We're going to go ahead and set that as a level one heading as well. All right, so now that we've got all of these headings, the subheadings, and the title set, all right, what was the point of all of this? The next thing that I'm going to want to talk about is table of contents. Table of contents is especially going to be useful when you are doing longer and more comprehensive documents, especially if you're doing training documents or any sort of brochure that uh, covers a catalog of your product or your services. So I'm going to come in here and decide where I want my table of contents to start. I'm going to want it on page one. I can put it after the introduction if I want, but I'm thinking that for these uh, purposes, I'm going to put it right here after the title. So, going back into our references tab, there is, it's typically on the left here by default, the table of contents drop down. If you click on that, you can see a couple of different options here. There, um, there are two automatic options, and there's a manual option. Uh, you can also go to office.com and download additional table of content styles. If you don't like the kind that has the line that goes all the way across the page, or if you want something a little bit more compact, uh, there are as many iterations of these default templates as you can possibly imagine. Or, of course, under the manual option, you can create your own. But, uh, especially if you have a very large document, the more you can automate, the more time you save. If it's there and you're already using uh, you know, these header features, it just makes sense to use the automatic option. So I'm going to go ahead and use number one. And you can see they're not really appreciably different. This one's called contents. This one's called table of contents. Other than that, they pretty much look the same. So you can, of course, go in and uh, customize these. You can also uh, decide where in the document you want it to go by right-clicking. If you just click on it, if you left-click on it, it's just going to put it where your cursor is. If you right-click on it, you have options uh, no matter where your cursor is currently located. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I just click on it, and it gives me my table of contents immediately. It's already there. It's formatted. It shows page numbers. And you can see the difference between the level 1 heading and the level 2 heading. So the level 2 heading, when we assigned that element, or we assigned the What's New section as that element, you can see that it's indented. It shows that it is something that falls under the introduction category. It lets you really organize this very, very cleanly and with very minimal time. I mean, you saw I spent a lot of time talking about it, but it took one click. So it was done that quickly, that easily. Now let's say that you set your table of contents, but then you go through and you add some more elements, or you 
move some things around, uh, and now your table of contents is out of date. It's not reflecting what's actually on the page. All you have to do is right here click Update Table, and it will update. Uh, you can see in the description, after you hover over it for a second, it says it refreshes the table of contents, so all entries refer to the correct page number. This is also good if you, for whatever reason, uh, change the page numbers. Let's say that you don't want the first couple of pages to be numbered page one. Let's say that you uh, are considering a table of contents to be before the actual first page in the document. You have the option to, uh, to, set it, to change that there and it would then uh, show you the accurate page numbers. Or if you just end up adding enough uh, pages later, it'll update that count as well for you. Moving up, let's start talking about the Format Painter. I love the Format Painter. Format Painter makes it so that you can set an element, make a ton of tweaks to it, and not have to remember all of the steps that you took to customize a specific element. So let's say over here on our last page, I've got this, uh, the address right here, and I wanna make that stand out a little bit. So maybe what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here and draw a shape. I like, I like a nice rounded rectangle, why not? Let's draw, oops, let's insert a rounded rectangle. And I'm gonna draw it right around this area here. Now, when that happens, uh, one question that I did I get uh, that I did get uh, in the uh, registration was how do I make it so that text shows over an image when you add an image or an element? It gives you this drawing tools menu that pops up. If you click on format, you have the option over here to send the element backward, and not only can you layer it behind or in front of other elements, it recognizes that there's text there. And you can click Send Behind Text, and it automatically puts the text over the element that you just assigned. So you don't have to necessarily worry about drawing a text box. You don't have to worry about a bunch of other settings. You can just bring the text forward over the element. Then you can go ahead and make any uh, changes that you want to this, however you want it to go. All right, so let's say, so I've got this, and I don't necessarily like that particular color. So I'm gonna go over back to my drawing tools format options. And this little expander here will give you some other options. You can also see here that, let's say you wanted another element layered behind that. You can also do just the outline uh, transparent, or the outline of the shape with the background transparent, or you can make the color in the element semi-transparent, so it kind of colors what's over the image, but it doesn't block it out completely. So lots of options. Again, it's all in this Drawing Tools tab that comes out. So I'm going to go ahead and pick this one. I feel like that's already kind of the color scheme that we have going on here. Let's say I want the border to stand out a lot more. So I'm going to come in here. And uh, I'm going to change the shape outline. I want the shape outline to be darker, and I want the shape outline to be bigger. Let's set it there. Okay. Let's say I like this. This is good. I like the shape. I like the color. I like um, I like what I'm seeing here. Uh, and let's say that maybe because I've got an element up here that I really like. Let's say maybe this history lesson. Maybe I want uh, this history lesson portion to also have a little bit of, of standout. So I'm going to go ahead and use my shape tool again. And I'm going to draw a rectangle right here to make this history lesson spot pop a little bit more. And I'm going to send that behind the text as well. Now that I've got this rectangle, I go, oh shoot, I don't know what colors I picked. I don't know, you know, what weight did I set for that border again? I don't have to worry about it. Come up here under home. Make sure that you have the shape itself selected, not the text. If you wanted to select the text, if you wanted to take the formatting of the font that you're using, the color, the size, uh, you can use this. You can use Format Painter to adjust that as well. But this here is um, a little bit more visually it pops a little bit better. So I like this as an example. So make sure if you're doing uh, this to a shape that you have the shape selected or the element, whatever it is, come up here to Format Painter. And it will 
lie to me. <laughs> it will not. All right. Format Painter. All right, so now you can see how next to my arrow there's a little paintbrush. So with that paintbrush, I could select, if this was text, I could select an item of text. All right, Format Painter. I want to paint that. I click on the element, and now it matches. So I've clicked on the rectangle, and now the rectangle has the same color. It has the same border as did my uh, my little business card quasi footer that I added down below. That is how Format Painter works. You can use that for text. You can use it for uh, even photographs. If you've done some editing in line with a photograph, you can apply the format to uh, you know, another photograph that you load so that everything has a nice cohesive look and feel to it. All right, and go on to Find and Replace 2.0. This is kind of fun. I like that this element exists. Uh, find and replace has kind of always been there, but it's gotten more useful. So we all know that if there are, uh, let's say that you've got a document about uh, your CEO and his name is Alexander, but now he wants to be called Alex, you can go through the entire document. You can find and replace the name Alexander and change it to Alex. Pretty much everybody knows that is a thing that you can do. But when you use the new version of Find and Replace, you can also find and replace formatting. So you can see in here I've used the italics option to add some weight to some elements. But let's say that I don't really think that it's giving enough weight, but I don't want to go through and find every single one that I've assigned that format to. What I can do is in the in the in the replace tab, I can come down here and find things that are in a specific font. I can find things that are in a specific style. You can find elements that are in a specific size. You can even find color. Uh, you can search the entire document for different formatting options and then replace them quickly. So, and then if you go over to replace, you can replace it with, again, click on format, and I'm doing font, but you can also see there's a ton of other options that we can get into and play with. Let's say that I want everything that's italic right now, I also want it to be bold. I want it to be in, let's see, we're using this teal, so let's do this teal color here. And I could even change the font if I really wanted to, but we're not going to go too crazy. So I'm going to do this. Click Find Next, which is the same way that's always gone. It gives me something that's in italics, and I can hit Replace. You can see it makes it bold, and it changes the color. If I know for sure that I want to do it to everything, I can do it to Replace All. It tells you how many replacements it has made. So this has gotten so much more useful than it ever has been before, especially if you're changing company branding, especially if you have an older document that needs some updating. You can now do the search and replace for all kinds of different elements where you can change the color, you can change the font, you can change the look and feel without having to go through and manually find all of those pieces. So super exciting and um, as you can see, there are even more menu options down there. There are very few limits to what you can do with that now. I definitely encourage you to dig in and, and play around with that one. I could spend probably an hour just on that um, in and of itself. Autocorrect, how to make it work for you. One thing with autocorrect is that sometimes it corrects things you don't necessarily want it to be correcting. I know that um, it's become sort of a point of humor in this day and age that uh, autocorrect can, can cause some communication troubles if we're phrasing it delicately. Since autocorrect does exist within Microsoft Word, we want to make sure that, especially in a business context or in an academic context as we spoke about a little bit before, that we're not getting caught in those pitfalls. So there are a couple of different ways that we can access the settings for autocorrect. Let's say I typo this word, and it gives you the red squiggly line. Of course, you can right-click on it, and it'll give you the correct spelling. But it also has this little arrow here to where you can ask it to read the word aloud. Say that you think you know you've got the right word, but you're not sure if, that's the, if the way that it's pronounced is the version that you're using. You can click on this, and it'll read the uh, word aloud to you. You can make sure that you have the right word. It also gives you a couple of synonyms there as well. 
so that if you um, also, you know, it just gives you another visual cue whether or not you're using the word that you are intending to use. Now let's say that this is a proper name. You can, of course, add it to the dictionary. That's a feature that has existed for quite some time. If you never want it to give you that red squiggle again, you can uh, add it to the dictionary, or you can just ignore it. So those aren't new, but I like to touch base on them. You can also add it to autocorrect. Where this feature becomes useful is, let's say for whatever reason, I am constantly misspelling the word anticipated, and I'm misspelling it the same way over and over and over again. For whatever reason, my fingers don't want to type that word the way that it's supposed to be. I can add it to autocorrect so that it catches every time I'm making that repeat error and just fixes it for me. So you can have autocorrect work for you, especially once you, you know, if you've noticed a pattern in your your personal typing style or just you know repeat mistakes that are happening, let it work for you. Uh, there is also the uh, last menu option here is autocorrect options. You can hop in there. Um, that way. I do just also want to show you that if you go to File and Options, let's say that you don't have something that's misspelled, so you aren't sure how to get to how to get to the autocorrect options. If you go to Word Options, it is under Proofing, and then right there, Autocorrect Options. And this does also give you some uh, options here to edit the autocorrect, uh, the way that it functions, that it doesn't give you from the right-click menu. So if you aren't if you aren't seeing something in the right-click menu that you want to use, go through the, the menu through file and you'll, you might be more likely to find what exactly you're looking for. Um, this, however, does also apply to all Microsoft Office programs. You can see that this is something that it does uh, specify that it's for the Office suite not necessarily just Word. It does also have a section down here for when correcting grammar and spelling in Word. So uh, this is an additional option here as to the uh, autocorrect option screen, which is what will pop up if you use that right-click option. So this is the screen that comes up if you right-click. Uh, it does give you some of these default ones. Uh, if you accidentally, like if you hold the Shift key down for too long and you get two uh, capital letters at the start, that is a default autocorrect uh, feature. You can see some of these others as well. Um, capitalize the first letter of sentences, capitalize the first letter of table cells. So those are all turned on by default, as well as everything in this table down here. So a lot of these uh, show some really frequently mistyped words that it will automatically fix for you without you having to define these in a dictionary. So like here, it shows you know fields. People sometimes put the E before the I. It automatically corrects it. This is where you can add something if you know for sure that uh, when you first open up the program that you want something specifically autocorrected every single time, you can add this manually that way. You can also set exceptions. So if you have a company name that is maybe missing a vowel, uh, that is, you know, a fairly popular way to reference you know, company names or there's lots of products that we use within our businesses that have some spellings that are close to the actual word, might get caught in autocorrect. You can set exceptions so that it does not correct those. Same here with the, the first letter. Don't capitalize that. Don't correct, you know, some of these as well. You can customize that to your heart's content. Uh, auto format as you type also has a couple of options in here that you will find useful. Uh, by default, it is going to change your ordinal. So if you have you know, things like first, second, third, it will take the, uh, the ordinal there and put it as a superscript, which means it'll be in smaller letters towards the top of the number. It's just a little bit more visually pleasing. If for whatever reason you hate that it does that, you can come in here and turn it off. Same thing with uh, changing the quotes fractions, and hyperlinks, uh, especially if you're doing a lot in print and you don't necessarily want hyperlinks to show up uh, in blue and underlined, you can deselect that option so that it never, ever does that. Uh, if you are, however, using it for documents that are shared online, you probably want to leave that active so that that feature works as advertised. One thing I do want to show you with that is that if there are, say for the most part, you do want your email addresses and your websites to format as hyperlinks, but there's an exception to that rule, 
what you can do is highlight the the hyperlink or the email address that you want to de-emphasize. You don't want it to look like a link. Go into your styles under the home tab and click where it says normal. It's going to take away the underline and it's going to take away that font color. That said, even as a digital document, it still leaves that link feature option enabled. So you still have the ability to control, click, and follow the link. In this case, it's going to open that email or open a, a new email for you to use that email address. But then you can take that same document, send it to print, and it's not going to um, it's not going to have different formatting. It's not going to stand out and look like right. So that is some fun with autocorrect. Uh, going to sharing and collaboration. One of the best features in micros in the most recent version of Microsoft Office is the uh, option for Microsoft OneDrive. With Microsoft OneDrive, you can save a document to the cloud. So if you go over to File, so File is up here, you can save to, uh, you can save it to OneDrive or you can save it to your local computer. If you save it to OneDrive, it's going to go to the uh, shared cloud account where other people in your organization or anyone that you choose to share the link with has access to open that file. If they're also using uh, the online version of Microsoft Word, if they have access to that, they have the ability to edit in real time alongside you. So now you have a collaborative element to the document that you're working on. So let's say that you have a teammate who is going to be handling that history lesson portion. They can handle that element while you are continuing to work on other portions of the document. So that uh, the cloud feature has opened up a whole new world to being able to edit documents. You don't have to worry about most recent saved versions. You don't have to worry about um, you know, transferring files back and forth and then maybe using an older version. Everything is in the, in the cloud and everything is saved real time. So that is one of the best innovations in the most recent version of the Microsoft Office Suite. Some bonus tips that we've got. Um, there are some things that people really wanted me to go over. One thing that I want to touch on is going to be sections. The way that sections works in Microsoft Word is the, consider it as there's text within paragraphs, within uh, sections, within the document itself. So everything is kind of nesting. So each document is going to have sections by default. What a section is, is it is uh, either a single page or a range of pages that all have the same formatting. Where this comes into play is if you want to uh, start to break up the elements that you are having in your page. Let's say that you want this to be on a new page. Lots of people are familiar with the page break. However, there is a different way to do this that will allow you to edit some of the formatting uh, for certain portions of the page without affecting the formatting of the others. So let's say that I want uh, the employee spotlight to go on its own page, but I also want it to be formatted as a two-column article. If I try to apply the columns feature to this section, it's going to, or this area right now, it's going to apply those two columns to the entire document. You don't want that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click here at the end of the, uh, the area that I want to stay the same. So keep in mind that whenever you apply a section, it is for the elements moving forward. So it's for everything that comes afterwards. It's not going to touch what happened before. So I'm going to go into Layout. I'm going to click on Breaks. I'm going to come down here to Section Breaks. Now, I want this next page or this uh, next section to start on a new page. So I'm going to go ahead and click on next page. So just like a page break, it's going to drop it down to its own page. Now that I've done that, though, I don't want this history lesson and the rest of it to be a uh, to follow the formatting that I'm going to set for the employee spotlight. But I also don't want it to go to a new page. So what I can do here is come back into breaks again and select continuous. 
again, keep in mind that my cursor is at the end of the element that I uh, want to have the previous formatting, and it is before the element that I want to have its own formatting. So I'm going to click Continuous, and now there's a break there, but it is not going to a new page. So now I can take and edit this Employee Spotlight section. So within the Employee Spotlight section, if I want this to be in two columns, I can just come up here, hit Columns, and Two, and it puts that into two columns without affecting the rest of the page. So sections is a fantastic way to uh, define individual formatting areas and keep it uh, with to edit that formatting without editing the formatting of the rest of the page. So I went in to undo that, and just one thing I want to show you is even within that element, what I can do is ignore the header and select just the text and move that into two columns. So now I think it looks a little bit better that way. But if I wanted to add a picture of Sally, who is the employee that I'm handing the spotlight to, you can add that you know, in line with this as well. So that's kind of nice. Uh, one other thing that I want to do super quick. I don't, that did not, why did you not follow? Oh, because those aren't linked together. That's why. Uh -huh. OK. Um, Actually, that would be a good thing to go over as well. So this would be a great place because this um, the text moved down, but the image itself didn't. So maybe before this would be a great place, and after this element here would be another place to um, insert another break. So this one I'm just going to do just a page break because uh, I don't need it to be special formatting. So now that goes down there. That can be on the last page. That's a nice element for the you know the closing page for this little workbook that we're doing. One other quick trick that I want to show you right now is um, how to do a line that you can type on. A lot of times when, let's say, you're filling out a form, you'll type name and then give a bunch of these underscores, and that's fine in print, but then if you wanted to type on it, you come and put my name, it moves the line itself. A different option for that is if you do three dashes and hit end, oops, there you go. All right, so do three dashes, you have to do it on a new line. So if you do three dashes and then hit enter, now you have this line you can type on and the line stays where it is and it does not wrap around. So that is just something I see a lot, um, especially in documents where uh, people want a form to be filled out, but they want you to email it back as opposed to printing it and giving it back. It's just a nice feature to know that it exists in there. It's kind of hiding. It doesn't really advertise itself, but it is there. Last thing I'm going to touch on is going to be mail merge. The number one thing that people were requesting uh, as in this demo was mail merge. Now, the best thing about this version of Word is that mail merge is as painless as it possibly could be. There is a mail merge wizard that will take you through step by step exactly what you want to do and make it as painless as humanly possible. So under mailings, if there's this start mail merge button and down at the bottom, it's a step by step mail merge wizard. So it opens up this uh, mail merge element here. You can, oh, it's actually taking me because I was doing this earlier. Let's start at the stop, or start at the top, excuse me. So it gives you the option to select a document type this is going to be a letter. Uh, you can also obviously do email or envelopes or labels uh, if you're doing something different. Down at the bottom it says next starting document. Go ahead and click on that. We want to use the document that we have right here. This is what we're going to be mailing out. You can also start something new from a template or start from a different existing document. We're just going to use what we have in front of us because this is what we want to mail. Next, select recipients. So you want to use an existing list. You can also type a list manually if you wish, or you can select from your Outlook context or context contacts. <laughs> I don't know why that word wouldn't come out right. However, a lot of um, us have a an Excel file or spreadsheet file that has all of our contacts in it. So I'm going to click here where it says select a different list. I'm going to come to my documents where I have saved my address book. Now, of course, where you save your address book or what you title the file is going to be up to you, but this is what I've got here. Uh, keep in mind that if you have any headers 
on your columns in that address book that you have this box down here at the bottom checked. Uh, it will ignore the first row of data rather than try and uh, mail something to your headers. Say OK on that. It gives me the three addresses that I have loaded. I can sort them, I can define them, filter them if I like, or I can just click OK and send it to everybody. It doesn't give you any kind of pop-up or anything once it's successful, it just loads those in there. So you can click on Next to write your letter. Well, my letter is already written, but let's say that I want to put um, the address in the top. Say maybe I'm mailing, uh, maybe this is like a trifold that I'm mailing, and I want the addresses to be printed on it automatically. So if I click on where it says Address Block, it gives you some different options to uh, choose how you want to format the name, how you want it to appear, based on how formal it's going to be. I'm just going to click the default. Oh, you can also change whether or not you want the postal address or if you just want um, the, the person's name in there. And what it does is if you see it, it, it puts this in a kind of little bit of a, a code block, if you will. You can move that address block anywhere that you want. Make sure though that if it starts a line that you do hit enter um, to put a break in, otherwise it's going to start the existing text right after the end of the address block. So it make sure that you do give that some room to breathe uh, in the document that you're preparing. And if you, if you forget that step, don't worry, because when you go to preview your letters, it's going to show you a preview. And you can come in here and you can change the font, the size of this, uh, as much as you want, so that it, uh, if you want this bigger or bolder, if you want it smaller or more simple, maybe you want it to fit in an envelope with a window, uh, you can change it so that it fits however you like. And then at the end, you just complete the merge. You have the option to print, or you have the option to edit individual letters if there were changes that you wanted to make to uh, you know, anyone that you know for sure that you need to make a quick change to, however you want that to go. But for the most part, you can just go to print, send it to your printer, and you're done. It's going to print one for every person that was in your mailing list, and you're good to go. So that is uh, how we have that there. That is mail merge. All right, that is everything that we have for today about Microsoft Word. Please do keep in mind that our next webinar is going to be on January 25th, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. The topic we're going to be covering is going to be Microsoft PowerPoint. So much like we went into some of the lesser known but very powerful features of Word, we are going to do the exact same thing with PowerPoint. And I don't know if you can tell, but I kind of love PowerPoint. So I'm looking forward to that one as well. That is going to be everything for today. Thank you so much for joining. As I mentioned before, if you do have uh, comments or questions that did not get answered, or if you uh, did not get a response as of yet to your previous submissions, please do reach out to us. We are more than happy to help continue your education about Microsoft Word and make sure that you are good and comfortable with the software. Thanks so much, everybody.